I want to go talk to Peterson. Peterson, do you have any comments on the Nazi presence at your protest? The presence of Nazis and white supremacists assaulting people at your protest. Do you have any comment on that? Yeah, I don't like Nazis. Then why? Are you, why were they here? Well, how can I answer are there, that? If are there views in alignment with yours? At some point, yeah, you have I think to that's realize. a foolish question. Look, if you want to know what my views are, I've watched all of your videos. Yes. Including the yes, yes, I have. Yes. Then why would you ask such a question? Because, because this is my interpretation of your videos. You, apparently, I all, to all of the people who arranged the protest against you watched all of your videos. It's like, do you want to disavow? I have 150 videos on YouTube. No, you your lectures, which sparked the debate. Okay, okay. Do you I want to disavow the support? Could you let me talk to her for a moment? Then Don't call me that, please. So, I have 150 lectures on YouTube. There's 500 hours of my views. Do you really if think you that you're worth all of that time? So look, I will answer your question, okay? I've studied Nazism for a very long time. It's been four decades, and I understand it very well. And I can tell you that there's some awful people lurking in the corners, and they're ready to come out. And if the radical left keeps pushing the way that it's sounds pushing, very much like they're a threat. going to come. That sounds very much like a threat. That sounds very much like a threat. Would you like to disavow the physical violence trans people were physically assaulted at this rally in your name? Would you like to disavow that violence? Yes. So you wish that didn't happen, and Absolutely. you want to, and I'm okay. going to post this okay. online That's that you would fine. like people okay. to not to be to be more accommodating of trans people and people of color at your events in future. I would I'm like a person there of to color. be no Listen, violence. I am a person of color, and I felt very accommodated here. I felt like my too. voice. Thank I'm you very much. I'm also a Muslim, and I feel, feel, feel like this guy is I'm a person of color. I love many many you wanted to disavow. You wanted to disavow, and this is the disavow. I am not an advocate of violence. I'm speaking out the way I'm speaking out because I think this is a route to no violence. And violence is lurking. And you can say that that sounds like a threat. There was no violence at our protest, though. There was violence at your protest. So what does that because say about our views? It's not my protest. You know, ask, asking me continually afraid of questions isn't very helpful if you actually want to have a dialogue. You have no idea if I'm your enemy. You have no idea about me. You won't use my pronouns, so I'm pretty sure you're my enemy, yes. Yeah, well, I know you think that, but I don't believe that using your pronouns is going to do you any good in the long run. But would you use alternate pronouns if a student asked you to? I think I've made my position on that clear already. Well, perhaps not to our audience at home who are just being introduced to this. Would you use alternate no. pronouns? And why not? I, because I don't believe that other people have the right to determine what language I use, especially when it's backed by punitive legislation. And when the words that are being required are the constructions, there are artificial constructions of people I regard as radical ideologues whose viewpoint I do not share. And Bill yeah. C-16 is actually not about cisgender people. It's about protections for transgender people. And that's not, you know, it's not about Jordan Peterson. So, and you know, we should have people learning to listen more. We have two ears and one mouth for a very good reason. When things get political, I like to ask who benefits and who gets to decide the rules of the game? So, you know, mostly with this Peterson controversy, which is really just a small drama, a tempest in a teapot, you know, he could just get over learning to program a few pronouns into his phone. By the way, I only have half a dozen or so that I actually use on an everyday basis. So it's not all that difficult. Professor think, Peterson, sorry, you know, Professor Peterson, good job, because I think Professor Peterson wants to, to get in on that. Yeah, well, kindness is the excuse that social justice warriors use when they want to exercise control over what other people think and say. So, you know, if we're bandying back and forth uh, our, our differences in values, you know, um, I, I would say that the highest possible value is truth and that uh, one of the concomitants is that is that is that we need stringent protection for freedom of speech so that we can utter the truths that we see fit. And I think that that's a, a value that's much higher than, than kindness, for example. I mean, there's lots of situations in life where, where kindness in the immediate present is not a, the appropriate way to, to react at all. But so, for example, I'll, when um, you discipline children, you often hurt their feelings in the short term so that they can learn to behave properly um, in the medium to long term so that their lives go well. And so this automatic assumption that the people on the social justice warrior side of the equation are motivated only by kindness when they're also clearly motivated by power is something I find completely untenable. And I don't think that Pete's solution to program my cell phone so that I can remember what names people need to be called is a reasonable solution at all. We're, we're actually supposed to now use electronic devices to bolster our ability to speak freely How do in you case remember we names, offend Jordan? someone. Is it that these made up pronouns, of which there are many, dozens in fact, and there's no consensus on them, and that doesn't even 
begin to start a discussion about the use of the other kin pronouns, and you can look those up if you want, because if you can define your identity subjectively any way you want, then there's absolutely no reason that you can't claim a non-human identity, and you may not know, but in the LGBT uh, rainbow coalition, there is Q+, and the Q+, people include the other kins who claim a non-human identity, and they're arguing in that rainbow coalition that they have the same right to their, um, to their pronouns that everyone else does, and their pronouns include such things as wor worm self. You're not supposed to interrupt. Actually, I was just going to ask if you could go back to the point about the analogy. Uh, between uh, the racial slur and the and the I don't think there's use. any analogy at all. But that's I think what the difference between hear I'm want. talking about compelled speech. There's a difference between saying that there's something you can't say and saying that there are things that you have to say. And I regard these made-up pronouns, all of them, as the neologisms of radical PC authoritarians. Do you understand that? And I don't. I'm not a fan of that sort of person. And the reason I'm not a fan of that sort of person is because I've done my homework. I've read everything I can get my hands on in the development of authoritarian political systems, and I know the literature inside out and backwards. And I am not going to be a mouthpiece for language that I detest. And that's that. <laughs> who I'm a great admirer of, once described an old religious idea, and that was that God ruled the world with two hands, right and left, mercy and justice. And the world couldn't survive if only mercy applied, because then no one would ever be encouraged to adopt the trappings and responsibilities of adulthood. You end up in a situation where you're forgiven for absolutely everything you do or fail to do, you're, you're, you're thrust into the Freudian nightmare of the Oedipal family, where your utter uselessness is forgiven on the grounds of compassion, and you end up living in your mother's basement until you produce fantasies <laughs> as a consequence of your squelched development of perhaps going out and shooting up a high school. Um, mercy, in its excess, produces pathology. Justice, in its, excess, in its excess, produces pathology, too, because people are not... are not perfect, and that means that we all fail when we attempt to do the things that we know that we should do, and so being held to account for our failures has to be tempered by mercy, but both principles have to apply. Justice means there's structure and rules, and the people who abide by the structure and play by the rules and move towards the top win. And mercy means we're forgiven our failures so that we can rise up and play again. But you can't have one without the other because the world falls apart if you do. And this is my problem with tolerance because tolerant people first of all let's say those who claim proclaim the virtues of tolerance believe that they're tolerant but generally that's not the case they just don't want to accept the responsibility that playing by the rules would bring one of the problems with postmodernism is that and this is a big problem, like this is a fatal problem, apart from the fact that it's incoherent and there's no value structure in it, and it's fundamentally divisive and destructive. There's a logical problem with it too that's even worse. And so you might be noticing that the LGBT set of acronyms keeps growing, eh? And it, it's, it's, kinda, it's kind of a form of its own parody in some sense. It's like, well, I'm oppressed. It's like, yeah, yeah, you are. And well, well, I'm oppressed too, yeah, you're also oppressed, and maybe I'm even oppressing you, being part of this other marginalized group, but at least we share our oppression. Well, I'm also oppressed, well, so am I, I'm oppressed too. It's like, okay, so here's the problem, there's a big problem here. The problem is, it's true. You're oppressed, you're oppressed, you're oppressed, you're oppressed. God only knows why. Maybe you're too short or you're not as beautiful as you could be or, you know, your, parent, your grandparent was a serf, likely, because almost everybody's grand, great-grandparent was. It's like, you know, and you're not as smart as you could be and, 
you have a sick relative and you have your own physical problems and it's like frankly you're a mess and you're oppressed in every possible way including your ancestry and your biology and the entire sum of human history has conspired to produce victimized you with all your individual pathological problems it's like yes true well so what do you do in the face of that suffering try to reduce it start with yourself what good are you get yourself together for Christ's sake so that when your father dies you're not whining away in a corner and you can help plan the funeral and you can stand up solidly so that people can rely on you that's better don't be a damn victim of course you're a victim Jesus obviously how do you overcome the suffering of life is be a better person that's how you do it well that's hard it takes responsibility there's all these ruined people out there they've got problems like you can't believe off they go to work and do things they don't even like and look the lights are on my god it's <laughs> unbelievable it's it's a miracle it's a miracle and we're so ungrateful college students the postmodern types they're so ungrateful you know they don't know that they're surrounded by just a bloody miracle it's a miracle that all this stuff works that all you crazy chimpanzees that don't know each other can sit in the same room for two hours sweltering away without tearing each other apart because that's what chimps do so <sighs> with regards to respect you know you said well human civilization progresses a lot better if we respect one another and I, I actually don't believe that at all I believe that human civilization pr progresses and maintains itself when we respect people who've earned respect you don't just respect everybody randomly well, what the hell use is respect if you just respect people randomly it's like inflating the currency you know it's like the Simpsons episode where you know Bart gets a trophy because it's every child gets a trophy day all you do is inflate the currency respect is actually limited to that category of people who have earned respect in some manner so whatever you're talking about with regards to say common decency between people it's not respect and the definitions actually matter they matter a lot and so I hear the respect argument all the time but you also can't force me to respect you you, I mean, you might be able to force me to act like I respect you, but you can't force me to respect you. It's just not possible. There's a complex issue here, which is to what degree do you allow individuals to, to govern the conversation that's had about them in their presence or otherwise? But I would just revert back to my original argument, which is that's a negotiation. It's either a negotiation. You've got three states. You can negotiate with someone. You can be their slave or you can be their tyrant. And I would pick negotiation, but as far as I'm concerned, the law right now, as it's currently instantiated, is a tyrant, and it makes people into its slave, and we're going to pay for that. And it's paid, predicated on, hypothetically, on respect and compassion. I don't buy that for a second. I don't think that's true in the least. And there's a huge literature on compassion. Here's a problem with compassion. Mother grizzly bears are very, very compassionate towards their cubs. But if you get near those cubs, they'll tear you to pieces. And that's the flip side of compassion. And I'm speaking not as a lawyer here, but as a psychologist. That's already well documented. Compassion is by no means a, an emotion that produces the desired social outcome. Quite the contrary. Quite the contrary. Life is very much more complicated than, than well, if you were just empathic, everything would work out. It's like you can't be equally empathic to everyone. And that's a big problem. They basically... In order to not bother anyone who they had consulted with, they decided, for example, that gender identity should be nothing but subjective choice, which is, I don't even know what to say about that. If you're a psychologist and you have any sense at all, that's a completely insane proposition. It's, first of all, predicated on the idea that your identity is your subjective choice. And that's never been the case for any sort of identity anywhere. So partly your identity is the set of tools with which you function in the actual world, and part of it is a negotiated agreement with the other people around you, and that's all being taken out of the... That's, that's all actually, as far as I can tell, that line of theorizing is technically illegal now in Ontario. And I'm not even talking about the potential biological basis of identity, because the idea that identity has no biological basis, that's just wrong. It, it, like factually wrong so and we've written a social constructionist we've written a radical social constructionist view of identity into the law but even worse than that we've gone beyond social constructionism because Piaget was a constructionist 
into just pure whim. Your identity can be at any moment what you assume that it's going to be. That's not a tenable solution. It's, there's nothing about that proposition that's reasonable. So I'm going to read you something that a graduate student sent me from the University of Toronto the other day, and I, I can also tell you that I've received hundreds of letters like this. Today, I had a tutorial at the University of Toronto where I talked about Jordan Peterson and issues of personal identity, legally sanctioned identity categories, etc. I brought up a video of a tall white man in his 30s who asked students at a university how they'd react if he told them he identified as a woman, as black, as short, and as five years old. Spoiler alert. Students in the video resist some of the later categories a bit, but are mostly accepting. Still, students were not engaging in discussion. I asked them why. One said it was because she was worried to share her opinion for fear of being singled out or saying something offensive. I asked who else was not speaking for that reason. The whole class put their hands up. No participation. Why? They weren't uninterested. They were afraid to speak their minds. I'll start with lawyer one, who was the counsel to several prime ministers. He talked to me about the Human Rights Tribunal because I went and saw him two weeks after this all started. Human Rights Tribunal is a kangaroo court, in my opinion, and it should be abolished as fast as possible. It's one of the many institutions in Canada that pose a threat to your, to your freedom that, that is of almost unimaginable proportions. Here's what this top lawyer told me. If I'm taken in front of the Human Rights Tribunal, it will cost me $250,000. I will pay the legal costs for my opponents, and I will lose. He said, go back to your safe little life and shut your mouth. The proposition that your identity is somehow unmoored from a reality outside of your subjective, say, and linguistic space is also, it's, it's, it's wrong. It, there's no other way of putting it. So, like, and this is written into the law already, so the proposition is that Biological sex, which many of the holders of, of saying what admiration for this law don't even believe exists, which I, I don't even know what to say about that, but the proposition is that biological sex, gender identity, gender expression, and sexual uh, uh, preference vary independently. That's the law. And it's wrong. It isn't even close to right. The bloody human resources department at the University of Toronto has adopted an equity position. Okay, so what equity means is that it doesn't mean equality of, of opportunity. It means equality of outcome. And that is, uh, 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 the, so this is the idea. The idea is that you take a, uh, a social institution like a university, and then you look at the organization of that university at every single strata, from the executive level all the way down to the student level. Then what you do is you do an analysis of each level by community demography, right? You get to define the demographic characteristics that you're going to discuss, however, which is actually a big problem. Then you make the presupposition that unless that organization at every level matches the demographic representation of, the, of, of people at every level, then it's corrupt, oppressive, and discriminatory, and it needs to be changed. Okay, so you think, well, what's wrong with that? Every level should have 50-50 men and women, let's say. It's like, you're really sure about that, are you? You're so sure about that. You don't think there's any natural differences in interest between men and women. Well, if you don't think so, then why are most psychology classes 80% women? And that, and that, and that uh, differentiation is accelerating rapidly, like I've seen it over the course of my career, from maybe 60% men at the beginning of my career to like 80% women now. And men occupy more of the positions in the STEM, in the STEM, uh, STEM fields, at least for now. It's the same in bloody Scandinavia. It's 20 to 1 nurses, 20 to 1 women to men nurses in Scandinavia, and 20 to 1 men to women in engineering. And that's in Scandinavia. And so what's happened in Scandinavia, as they've made this society more egalitarian in terms of its legal and social structures, is that the gender differences in personality between men and women have got bigger, not smaller. So what that means is that social constructionism is wrong. That's what it means. Wrong. Disproved. It's exactly the opposite of what the theory would have predicted, because the theory predicted, and God only knew how it was going to sort itself out. It's like, not like people knew this to begin with. 
the idea was that as you e equalize the social, the social uh, uh, structure, that the differences between men and women would disappear. Guess what? That didn't happen. And it's not studies of just a few hundred people in a few locations. Those are population-wide studies, and they've been replicated multiple times. So, and the, the funny thing is, is that, so there are temperamental differences between men and women. It's, and neuroticism and, and agreeableness are not the only temperamental differences. So if you fragment extroversion, it fragments into um, assertiveness and gregariousness. Women are more gregarious, men are more assertive. If you fragment conscientiousness into orderliness and industriousness, women are more orderly and men are more industrious. If you fragment openness, which is the creativity dimension, into interest in ideas and interest in aesthetics, you find that women are more interested in aesthetics and men are more interested in ideas. So, so, because you can fractionate the big five into ten, you get gender differences across all of them. And they're not trivial either. They make a difference. So, okay, so the, anyways, back to the equity thing of all the preposterous and idiotic ideas. So, first of all, to, to make gender equity across every dimension of, a, of, a, of an organization, you have to assume that men and women have identical interests or, and, and temperaments and that if they don't, the state should intervene to bloody well ensure that they do, which is something for all you women to figure out, because now there's many, uh, many, what, uh, positions in society that women preferentially occupy. So what are you going to do about that? And what are you going to do about the Asians? Because they occupy preferential positions as well. You know, they're overrepresented in all sorts of professional institutions. And the probability is that that's going to increase. What are you going to do about that? What about the Jews? What are you going to do about them? Because they have, they're in the same position as the Asians. You're going to put quotas on all those people? What kind of stupidity is that? And then it's worse, too, because let's say you equalize women, and for, just for the sake of argument, across all these different dimensions of society. Well, then what are you going to do? Are you going to, are you going to equalize for black women and, and Latino women and Asian women? Are you going to subtype black women? Because it's not like they're all the same. Are you going to ensure that women from lower classes are, are represented just as much as women from upper classes? And how many generations back are you going to go to check that? What about intelligence? What about attractiveness? How about height? How about weight? So the problem with the fractionation by group identity is that it's endless. There's no way of ensuring equality across groups because there's an infinite number of groups. You can fragment group identity all the way down to the level of the individual, which is exactly what you should do, which is what we already did in the West. We figured, well, the ultimate diverse population is a population of individuals, so you let the individuals sort it out. No, no, we're going to replace that with group. Well, what that means for the bloody social activists is that they'll be able to play this game forever because you can continually fractionate <laughs> group identity ad nauseum, and so the system will never be equal. And you can bloody well be sure that as we implement social uh, policy to make sure that all outcomes are equal, that the amount of space that you personally are going to have to maneuver in is going to shrink and shrink and shrink and shrink. We've already seen that happen in many societies. You think we would learn from the 20th century? I was just going to ask if you could go back to the point about the analogy. Uh, between uh, the racial slur and the and the I don't think there's any analogy at all. But that's I think what the difference between hear I'm want. talking about compelled speech. There's a difference between saying that there's something you can't say and saying that there are things that you have to say. And I regard these made-up pronouns, all of them, as the neologisms of radical PC authoritarians. Do you understand that? And I don't. I'm not a fan of that sort of person. And the reason I'm not a fan of that sort of person is because I've done my homework. I've read everything I can get my hands on in the development of authoritarian political systems, and I know the literature inside out and backwards. And I am not going to be a mouthpiece for language that I detest. And that's that. <laughs>